I'm going to talk about uh, design leadership uh, and uh, particularly how to make design a strategic capability and how to scale design in a particularly large organization. Um, well, first of all, um, one of the things that you can see uh, for sure the last couple of years is that uh, global enterprises who are often very large and complex, uh, they uh, more and more start to recognize the role of uh, creativity and design as an opportunity to advance innovation and enhance brand experience. Uh, and um, uh, I remember when I was appointed as chief design officer for 3M in 2013, I was probably one of the first five in the world uh, that was uh, uh, appointed in a role like that. Uh, and nowadays, uh, there are more, maybe 20, 30 in big companies that, uh, that are appointed in, in, a, in, an, in an executive role uh, for design. Um, one of the things that is also interesting is that you see, uh, and this comes from the Design Intact report uh, from John Meda, although from 2019, uh, that is when he made the last uh, report, but um, that there is a lot of uh, uh, acquire uh, for talent uh, going on. So uh, over 100 firms in, uh, from uh, 2004 to 2019 are acquired, of which uh, 60%, so 60 of the 100, were from 2015 onwards. And this is all uh, uh, to get uh, uh, quick access to talent. Uh, and is a, is a way to, uh, to, to boost and scale your design in your organization. The first question we need to have is, why would you like to build an in-house design team? And uh, here in this scheme, you see from the left to the right that uh, if um, uh, at the left side, 80% of your design is outsourced, uh, you for sure will uh, have challenges on the quality and the scope of what is outsourced. Uh, your brand consistency is not managed and orchestrated probably. Uh, efficiency is, an, is, a, is a topic, and, uh, and how do you uh, capture the knowledge in, into your own organization in order to further build uh, your design capabilities? If you go to the right side, where 80% is um, insourced, uh, you see that uh, you can become a brand design can become a brand custodian for the company. Uh, you grow your knowledge pretty rapidly in design. Uh, there is a central orchestration on brand going on, and uh, and of course you can start to uh, share scarce resources in design because. Design is not uh, not easy to uh, to hire, and uh, and there is a lot of uh, uh, talent war going on at the moment. So um, you see here the, the couple of reasons. First of all, you uh, you want to bring in well. And when I started in my role in 3M, uh, I I was totally at the left side. Maybe 20 percent or even less was in uh, in sourced, and all the rest was outsourced. And so you do this because you want to have an accelerated focus on the development of your design capabilities if you all centralize it and, and orchestrate it. You want to make for sure uh, uh, that you want to secure the translation of insights to value propositions as a strategic core. I was surprised by uh, the, 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 the pretty uh, detailed insights research that was done by the company that was given of course, to consultants uh, to help them on uh, the creation and, uh, and the ideation on new value propositions. But all of those insights were uh, you know, leaking outside of the company. And I, I always uh, mentioned to the CEO that, in my opinion, the translation from insights to value propositions is, is a core strategic activity that you need to keep close to your chest. Uh, drive cost efficiency, uh, I have proven and uh, seen in different companies that if you insource your design, you can at least uh, uh, save an, a 20% on your costs. You can safeguard your ownership of uh, design and uh, general intellectual property. You can drive your brand consistency through the orchestration of all the things that are created. And um, you can also start to elevate outsourcing quality through fewer and better supplier partnerships. And I think that was, uh, I think, the call that I did in the company to, uh, to get design in an orchestrated way going. Well, uh, if you think about design, and particularly in the innovation to market uh, cycle, then uh, you see here um, that if you think about what the, uh, the function of a company is, uh, then you can say, okay, a company has to identify value, has to develop value, and has to deliver value. This is a kind of an old white paper of McKinsey that is uh, describing this. And this is, for me, a very simple way of describing the mechanism of a company. Well, the identification of, uh, of value is very much linked to innovation. The development of the value is there where you create the, the brand experience or the customer experience. And then you need to deliver that value uh, through marketing and uh, uh, a point of sale and marketing communications to your customers. 
And it is uh, through all of these um, uh, phases where design uh, is playing a role and can add value. In, in many, many tech companies, uh, design is mainly focusing on, um, on uh, the innovation part and, and the ideation part. But uh, I can tell you in my practice, 80% uh, of all my capacity and effort was going into creating the customer experience. Uh, and so that is something that is very underwhelmed uh, in, still in many companies. So uh, if you talk about the taxonomy of design, then uh, this is a very simplified uh, uh, scheme where you can see from the left side to the right side, you identify the, the value in the marketplace. You identify based on insights together with your marketing, R&D, and strategy, strategy partners, a value proposition. But then you need to have to uh, start to work it out uh, in, into a uh, tangible product, package, uh, service, or whatever you have. Uh, by uh, a functional and an aesthetic design through the product, the packaging, the digital, the retail, and so on. Uh, you see here in the design function, uh, the number of design capabilities. Uh, I have had teams up to 30 different uh, uh, capabilities from uh, UX designers to packaging to interior human factors. You can go on and on and on. And uh, these are all specialisms within design. Uh, and then, of course, uh, together with engineering and manufacturing and distribution, you have to make sure that... Uh, uh, the value is going to be introduced to that marketplace successfully in the end. So if you, if you summarize the value spaces where design can play, it is, of course, the innovation uh, space where uh, ID, ID generation to, to concepts uh, and new values is uh, at hand. And for brand, for the brand experiences, because everything, every touch point to the customer is going to be designed in, in the end. And if you do this and run this through multiple uh, design agencies, then uh, the question is always who is managing the quality and the, and the consistency of all that. Design for marketing is the, the storytelling part, uh, very much uh, uh, important in the commercialization of the value. Uh, the efficiency part where you can do things smarter. I remember many, many of my design efforts went uh, to work together with the supply chain to think about alternatives for waste, for instance, and how we can reuse waste uh, in, a, in a way to become more sustainable, uh, which is very uh, hot topic at this moment in time. Uh, stakeholder engagement is where, particularly in a B2B environment, I did great collaboration projects uh, with partners and, uh, and, and customers to co-create uh, a new value together, which is a, a, a pretty uh, standard thing uh, uh, driven by uh, design thinking. And then design for strategy is also where you think about the future uh, scenarios uh, uh, driven by social cultural uh, trends and technology trends uh, to create a probable futures for the company then to evaluate and to to think about the future. So that is a, that is a lot. Um, and it's, uh, I want to highlight quickly uh, a recent study by the UK Design Council, what they call the Design Value Framework. I was so happy when I saw this. It's just uh, two weeks uh, published, I think. Um, that uh, of the four uh, dimensions that they measure uh, the value uh, of design, that uh, three of the four are non-financial uh, values. And I think that is so crucial because uh, the social, cultural, the environmental, the democratic, uh, you know, the community part of what you have to create as a company and the value that you have to contribute as a designer is so important. And so very often that impact is overlooked. It's also not easy to measure but, uh, but for the ones who are interested, I would like to refer to this uh, design value framework. So what you see in summary is that the complexity is increasing uh, and the, the world's major challenges are, are, are getting bigger and more complex. Collaborative creativity is an approach that is needed to, uh, to work across the value chains and with all stakeholders. And stakeholders, to talk about stakeholders, um, you know, um, very often we talk about customers and yes, uh, shareholders value also, but now uh, you see that employees and communities and partners are, are more getting to the foreground of, uh, uh, say, the, the purpose of a company. And you see that from the left side to the right side, uh, companies are developing pretty, pretty uh, rapidly from uh, driven by performance only and mainly to driven by purpose. And um, um, there is a great book out there from uh, uh, Hubert Julie, um, At the Heart of Your Business, which is a great book uh, that is describing, uh, you know, uh, uh, a more purpose-driven, uh, what, what you need to do to become a more purpose-driven organization. Well, I think that complexity is very well summarized in the UN Sustainability Development Goals, where you see 17 goals here, uh, and they are all systemic, 
uh, huge complex uh, challenges from uh, health to uh, education to mobility, sustainability, and so on, uh, equal equality. And uh, I would say that uh, uh, due to that complexity and due to the systemic nature of these uh, uh, challenges, uh, it is almost uh, needed that you need to collaborate and that uh, design for sure is also involved in all of this. So if you talk about collaborative creativity, uh, which was a theme that I introduced when I started my job at 3M, uh, I refer to this as applied design thinking. Just quickly as, as, a, as a reminder, design thinking introduced by uh, IDO, Tim Brown, in his book, uh, and he uh, changed by design, and he um, uh, describes here the three uh, areas that you, you get involved into, uh, where business is focusing on viability, technology on feasibility, and uh, design on desirability, and you have to work together to get in the sweet spot of that experience innovation. <clears throat> design thinking, in my opinion, is not a uh, process. This is a creative mindset. And that mindset is centered around empathy for people, it is sparking the inspiration to build and, and build quick prototypes uh, to get uh, quick feedback. And it is uh, very much built on a collaborative approach for co-creation. Uh, and I think uh, that is essential to, um, to make sure that you do uh, uh, say the right thing, you involve the right people in the process. And so technology push is, is not the right way to go. Uh, I think social uh, and uh, social cultural should be the leading and, and people and human human uh, humanities should be the, uh, the leading factor in all of this uh, in order then to find the right technologies that can help you to and this is a great overview from Gartner uh, where a design thinking and lean startup and agile are, 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 are I'll say are mapped uh, they are very often uh, uh, say uh, mixed up and and uh, people think from technology that you can use the one instead of the other uh, I would say uh, the design thinking is very much about uh, identifying the customer problem uh, how often have I been in lean startup uh, hip uh, uh, workshops with a lot of post-it notes uh, but uh, they, uh, when you ask what what, is, what the problem is that they solve, then uh, you get a lot of uh, uh, question marks in, in, in people's eyes uh, and, and not easy to, to identify. And I think design thinking is very much in the business of uh, problem definition. Um, and here you see if you use uh, thinking from the company to the customer, to the market or to your audiences, then uh, critical to the success is that you, in a collaborative way, uh, find the problem and, and, uh, and uh, define the problem in the right way and then collab collaborative uh, start to work. Well, uh, all of this uh, has uh, summarized in, in uh, what we call uh, the design uh, leadership equilibrium, sh uh, showing the, uh, the, uh, the complexities of what these design leaders have to uh, manage at this moment in time. Uh, and so uh, this is uh, uh, design leadership uh, in the center of driving value for society and planet. And of course, uh, I, I'm, I'm putting the design in the center of the universe here, but uh, of course, every uh, leader in the company together uh, has the role and the ownership to drive uh, all of that good value for society and planet. Uh, but it, it, uh, it needs fearless leadership uh, to take risks, to drive the right innovative, um, uh, say, uh, programs. Uh, you need to often balance dualities uh, that I speak later about. Uh, master all of these complexities, and, and it should be driven by purpose. And if you look to this scheme, which is described in our new book, which I talked a minute about, uh, you see that, um, yes, as a design leader in the, in the center, you have to um, take into account emerging technologies like data analytics and uh, uh, artificial intelligence and so on, um, th that are driven by cognition. Uh, you have to inspire a culture of creativity and innovation which is very much going into the mindset of your own people in the team. Uh, you need to, to be an advanced collaborator uh, to uh, support uh, interactions, not only within your team and across the team in the different functions of the company, but also uh, outside of the company with partners, uh, academia, uh, policymakers, and on, on what you need in order to, to work on those big systemic challenges that I just mentioned. Uh, and then, of course, design for equality uh, is, is, is something that is more and more important uh, and, and is a huge challenge, I think, at this moment in time. And, of course, innovation for sustainability uh, is a thing that uh, should be, uh, you know, integral uh, as part of your... So we were so uh, enthusiastic about 
uh, all of this topic that uh, we used 65,000 words and over 200 pages, 170 quotes from our research uh, based on 59 interviews with uh, executive design leaders around the world. Uh, we introduced 24 models in the book uh, in eight chapters uh, written by three co-authors and all based on one mission. And that is the mission of Design Leadership Ignited and how to elevate design at scale, particularly in, a, in larger, a complex organizations. So uh, my uh, partners in crime were Kjade Hemser from uh, the University of Melbourne, uh, who's a uh, professor of corporate entrepreneurship, and Julia uh, Calabaletta, who is uh, associate professor of strategic value of design in Delft University in the Netherlands. And, um, and I was, uh, at that time, when we were writing the book in Minneapolis, uh, and so we had a great cha uh, challenge uh, to write the book together uh, across three regions uh, in a time of, of the pandemic. So uh, we had some fun together uh, by working on Zoom meetings uh, to get the book together and, and get our thoughts organized. So uh, Gerda and Julia were uh, responsible for the research. And the core research question was how to engage in design leadership at scale. And you see here we had uh, close to 60 senior leaders. Uh, 54 executive level, uh, 46 for senior design level, uh, male 83%, and yes, unfortunately, still uh, uh, female design leaders are very underrepresented. I was very happy, by the way, in my design leadership team, I had 70% female uh, leaders. I was very uh, focused on um, getting, uh, uh, and, uh, say, uh, inclusive and diverse uh, team. Uh, the headquarters of all of these people that we have inter uh, interviewed were all over the world, and uh, they were across B2B and B2C. Um, so the aim of the book was to help to ground existing design leaders, but also to help uh, and enable upcoming design leaders to learn from uh, all the things that I had to learn over 30 years of, uh, of being a design leader, uh, and, uh, and also by, by learning by mistake, of course. And so... Uh, I never had any, uh, uh, you know, reference uh, for uh, let's say uh, design excellence and uh, uh, you know successful design leadership. Very difficult, uh, and, uh, and so uh, I really feel fortunate to uh, to um, have uh, written the book where we capture a lot of this. Um, it is about informing the business leaders because if the business leaders are good informed, they can uh, better they are better prepared uh, to uh, anticipate to work with designers. It is about supporting design consultants and, and, and brand and management consultants uh, to, uh, to, to help them to do a better job and, uh, and uh, prepare their organizations they work for to, uh, to build that capability of design when needed. Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, education is important to assist uh, ed education and inspire design leaders. So the, the key, key takeaways from the book to scale design and successfully are uh, threefold. First, uh, we learned that you need to have a structured approach that is essential for the success. Secondly, <clears throat> you need to have a navigate a navigate opposing uh, challenges. And thirdly, you have to build first a solid foundation before you can start to scale. I always say that uh, if your foundation is not right, you're asking for trouble uh, because you are going to uh, to uh, to scale trouble if, if the things are not solid at the foundation. It's like building a house on a bad foundation. So uh, I will talk a bit about those three. So when I got the role as chief design officer in the company, this was my simple, uh, uh, say, the task. Uh, the CEO asked me to drive design as a strategic platform throughout the global organization by building and managing multidisciplinary design teams uh, that advance um, innovation and um, brand experience. And... Um, you see here the design leadership uh, model that we introduce in the book. A simple question by the CEO, but not easy to, uh, to manage. So we identified, uh, uh, say, three stages. Uh, first, uh, establish the foundation, empowering and, uh, and scaling the design team, and then elevate to design excellence. And we have described those uh, three phases <clears throat> by the overall design leadership that need to, need to enable all of this, but also by the uh, uh, six uh, chapters that you see, topics, uh, like setting the design direction, uh, the design organization, how to form and shape that, the description of the design taxonomy, uh, how to build your design resources, uh, what kind of scaling and how is scaling working, and, uh, and all of that to the end state of, uh, of design excellence. Uh, so uh, if you want to bring design at the heart of the company, 
then uh, this is like a function, like any function, like HR, IT, finance. And there's another function that is supportive to, uh, to all of this. And you need to do organizationally uh, work on your governance. Uh, your creative leadership needs to be in place and, and your talent, of course. Operationally, you need to have your accountability. Uh, you have to drive efficiency and, and the quality of the work that you do by creative direction management. And then culturally, you have to build an, uh, an, uh, an, uh, an culture and an environment where uh, you know the values are pretty clear, uh, where there is empathy, uh, particularly if you talk about collaboration and the success of collaboration, you need to be empathetic to do that across different cultures. And you need to have a diverse team, of course. So... Um, if I summarize my role, then uh, the design leadership in the business is very much about bridge design and, and business all the time. Be the translator there. Manage stakeholder management, which is important also across the boundaries of your own company. In instigate change for progress. Uh, you know, ask those dumb questions. Uh, why and, and why not? Uh, in order to open up a dialogue on, uh, on alternatives. Inspire and lead by example. And then be proactive, a proactive entrepreneur. And the role that I liked the most was being the corporate rebel, of course, with purpose. But that is, uh, you know, finding uh, particularly those uh, things and behaviors that the company is doing for decades, and nobody is ever, ever challenging uh, those things. And so there is where the rebel role comes in, and, and uh, that is what I, I, I'm using for me. Uh, so you see, in the end, it all comes down to how the company works, because. Uh, Adding design in the company is not about adding capabilities in the corner of the team. This is integral to all your processes, to the mindset of the people in the company and the collaboration uh, uh, efforts that you do. So some of the attributes of a design leader, uh, I have uh, once uh, interviewed by uh, the UK Design Council. Of course, I talk about empathy to, uh, to work across uh, the, uh, the different um, um, functions. I create creative sensibility. Uh, particularly uh, to uh, the context of the leadership of design uh, to guide and inspire future thinking. And then, of course, the uh, great democracy and uh, patience is needed to navigate, uh, you know, any new ideas uh, across the organization. Innovation is not about the ideas. Uh, we have tons of ideas. We have too many ideas. It's all about finding the best idea, which is not easy, and then uh, manage and guide that best idea in a successful way through the organization in order to commercialize the idea. That's their true challenge. So uh, it all starts by describing uh, the design governance, uh, which is uh, in our research uh, remarkable to see uh, how many of the, of, of how few people of the, of the design leaders had described the governance. My opinion is that if you don't describe the governance, you, you, you have not, uh, the company doesn't know and you don't know how to engage in the company. So uh, this is about uh, describing who is sponsoring design from an investment point of view, who is managing the designers. That means who is doing their uh, reviews at the end of the year and who, who uh, how is the reporting lines, where, where are they located in a central way or decentralized, and then what are the rules of engagement? And of course, the scope of, uh, of text that can differ a bit per company. In the book, you can find this all back and uh, with all the flavors that we have identified through the research with the pros and cons. Another thing is uh, setting a design direction. If your vision is not very clear, you know, there is no, no beacon for the design team and for the company to aim uh, for and to re refer to. And that makes it very difficult to, uh, to buy into uh, the investment of design. So you need to have a vision mission. Uh, you need to translate this into a strategy that is, of course, aligned with the company. Uh, you need to make an, a one-year roadmap and an, uh, and an uh, operational plan so that you can measure your progress and, uh, and can uh, uh, talk and, uh, and, uh, and demonstrate your progress. And then um, the um, design scaling is uh, important. That you can We have identified two types of design scaling. One is uh, the qualitative and the quantitative. The quantitative is, do I have the right people? in the right capabilities available, and the qualitative is, do I have enough of those people available? And then particularly, if you have a global organization, uh, it means at, an, um, uh, at the particular locations that you are working for. So that approach should be scalable and flexible. It should be a kind of a demand generation, generate a demand generation by top down and, and bottom up at the same time, and strive for a design strategy. So uh, design is a tactics, important. 
versus a strategy. I see too many um, organizations very much focusing on design as a tactic. That's not where the value is. There's where the discussions on cost are continuously going, where design as a stylistic element, as an afterthought is used, uh, where uh, decisions are made on, on expert-based uh, decisions or personal opinions in this case, and where you come uh, with a very fragmented uh, uh, presence in the marketplace. Design as a strategy is where the value is created, where you work on systemic design solutions, research-based, where you approach it as a portfolio, uh, as part of an ecosystem, and where you have holistic value propositions, which is, particularly in the di digital era where we are in, uh, is so important because you can't um, uh, approach uh, digital uh, anymore as single, uh, uh, isolated, uh, uh, say, challenges. These are all systemic. I spoke a bit about uh, design leadership. To go to my last sheets uh, on uh, dualities, we, we identified uh, 16, I think, uh, uh, or 20 design um, dualities, uh, which, for instance, uh, one of them is, uh, you know, are you challenging the status quo versus adhere to the status quo, which is uh, any manager has to start to think about what, what I'm doing there. <clears throat> of you, are you using your formal authority in front of first, uh, informal uh, influence? In getting things going, uh, you know uh, how how much do you align to the company uh, rules and gear and and, uh, and guidelines, for instance, in HR. While uh, if you create an, a design framework, uh, HR framework, maybe you need to bring in some uh, some new elements there. Uh, safeguard the consistency at one hand, but also empower creativity. Uh, well, and lately, of course, uh, working from home or working from the from the office. Has a huge impact on uh, how people collaborate and uh, and the dy dynamics between people, and you need to take that to, uh, into account as well. Uh, design excellence is the end state, where uh, uh, you, you have identified that the company has the ambition uh, for long-term commitment to grow design, where design is expected to be a global function across all of the relevant businesses, functions, and geographies. And design strives to be supportive and instrumental to all relevant value areas that I uh, previously mentioned. Um, well, the good news is, uh, you know, it's great to to aim for that design excellence, but um, uh, you know, you never will reach it because uh, your environment is changing all the time, and your your reference is changing, and therefore, design excellence is an ongoing journey. So, in order to scale design successfully, you need to have a, a clear long-term plan going forward. Uh, in order to have a North Star, uh, you have to create design awareness, appreciation, and ambassadors. Uh, that is in order to create uh, the demand and, and get uh, people in your in your uh, in your area of design to invest. <laughs> this is about an ongoing dialogue across the disciplines, of course, with empathy, and then show don't tell the value of design. You need to measure the progress. Uh, uh, the, the financial drivers are very difficult to identify and to define. Uh, but progress is a very easy way to uh, uh, to uh, to share with the company to uh, to see how you do on your roadmap, and then embrace the complexities of design leadership rather than getting distracted and made ineffective by it, which we saw in our research that there are still a lot of executive design leaders that are distracted by uh, by the complexities and therefore they're, they're getting uh, less effective. With all of that, uh, elevating design at scale that is uh, in an organization is a quest for inclusion. At every level, it requires an ignited design leadership to engage effectively with the business leaders and drive transformation together. And so, because design is a bit different than many of the other functions, not special, but different, uh, there is a quest for inclusion. Uh, and so, uh, this is the quest for inclusion on thought and not on the things that uh, companies normally measure in terms of gender and, uh, and uh, cultural background. Uh, I think uh, the, the one that, that counts is for me uh, inclusion in, in thought. And, and I think if you want to be thought provoking, if you add designers to your team uh, to open up on creativity here. Uh, with all of that, I, I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, I'm open for any questions. Well, thanks very much, Eric. Really appreciate it. Um, I know many of my design peer, design uh, leader colleagues uh, have been fighting their way upstream in organizations for years for a more strategic seat at the table. So I know that your, your experience and your success certainly validates their efforts. And you mentioned uh, diplomacy and patience are key. I think that would resonate with them. Uh, we, we have some questions coming in. And before we get to those though, Max is going to include, uh, drop two links into the chat. The first one is for 20% uh, off Eric's book, Design Leadership Ignited. 
And the second link is our survey where you can share your learnings uh, with your peers in the conference. We'd appreciate uh, you filling those out. And we have some questions coming in as, as, as Max shares those links. Uh, the first one is from Patrick. Patrick, did you want to come on and ask your question? Uh, hey, sure. Uh, I work at Chick-fil-A, uh, which is the quick service restaurant uh, company in North America. Um, curious about, you know, where design sort of integrates across the lenses of those three disciplines that you talked about. Um, you, you show one of the various frameworks and models where innovation, agile and lean uh, kind of work cohesively together. I'm, I'm curious on how in your perspective, those three sort of disciplines have worked most effectively and, you know, you showed them in sort of congruent sort of ways, innovation, yeah. or is it more of a cohesive collection? Yeah it's, more co that? yeah, it's more cohesive, but for the sake of <clears throat> you separate these uh, different uh, uh, activities <clears throat> and why is that? Um, you also want to be uh, more precise of uh, who's playing uh, a role in what phase. And I would say uh, design, particularly in the in the problem definition uh, uh, phase, is very active, uh, very much uh, uh, involved. Uh, but uh, you know, um, if you have your problem definition, uh, you you're not throwing it over the wall. So you you start to to transfer the thoughts and the insights that have uh, driven the uh, the problem definition, uh, um, and, and maybe uh, because if you have the an, an exact description of the problem definition. You already have 95% of the solution if you do it well. And so, uh, so if you do that well, then of course, transferring this to the next phases, designers will be involved. But you, you see that the more they go to, uh, say, implementation, uh, there is a kind of a phase out. And, and the, the point of, of gravity is, is moving all the time by the people that uh, your marketing and your strategy and your engineering or, or your, uh, your uh, R&D departments, uh, that is a kind of a uh, uh, different per phase. I think the, the cross collaboration is, is the thing uh, to hammer on all the time. You know, uh, none of the functions is in the position to solve the, the huge complex uh, uh, challenges that we have. None of them, single, single. So uh, the collaboration part, it's like uh, playing football on the, on the field. You know, if you only have uh, offenders, uh, then uh, you go nowhere. Thanks, Patrick. Eugenio, nice to see you again. Uh, you had a question. Yes. Thanks, Scott. Uh, Eric, uh, first of all, thanks for sharing your thoughts and experience with us. Uh, I just note your Venn diagram when you showed this experience innovation is the intersection of many other innovation areas. Uh, what does it mean really for design teams? Uh, we talk about uh, it changes the way we collaborate or the kind of capabilities that you have to mm -hmm. mix up. What do you mean when you put emphasis on that uh, experience innovation? Well, experience innovation is, uh, in my opinion, where uh, you know all the touch points of the brand are uh, are coming together and are uh, consciously orchestrated by the company. And uh, and I see because many companies don't have uh, a multidisciplinary design team, uh, so they they are not in the position to uh, uh, create uh, those touch points themselves. Well, that is a choice, but if you can't create it yourself and you outsource it, you have to make sure that uh, there is an orchestration going on on consistency and the quality of those creations. And that is what I see is always missing. It's always, and particularly on a global level, you know, people do it local for local. And then what is very bad, I think, is that many of these uh, projects with outside consultancies are run uh, without even a design brief, without even understanding what the problem is that needs to be solved. And so, uh, so in my opinion, that is uh, pretty much a waste of investment for the company. Uh, it's very ad hoc and very short term. So uh, my proposition to the company was to orchestrate all of this. And uh, well, we were pretty successful in doing that. And, um, and um, but that means that uh, if you look to all of the touch points uh, to your customer, one way or another, they are all designed from brochures to point of sale, to product, to interfaces, to you, you name it. And so uh, I was building a team for the company. Uh, I was pretty successful. I started with 20 people. And when I left, uh, we had 200 people in five different locations in the world. 
And so I was able to convince the company to tenfold the investment of design in the couple of years that I was in the company. And so, uh, so uh, yeah, and I, I always said, I, I'm here to build an, an, a strong foundation because to, to build to innovation, sorry, to excellence in, in five years, that is almost impossible. You need, this is a marathon. This is not a sprint. So this, this customer experience theme is as big as brand and innovation. It's not, it cannot be owned by one single function anymore. You need to do it as a football team, again, uh, collaborate. Thanks, Eugenio. Thanks. Eric, I have, a, I have a few questions for you. One is, you know, besides your own book, uh, what other books on design leadership would you recommend? Well, there's different uh, design leadership books um, um, that uh, I can give you uh, the titles uh, later. Um, uh, I don't have them at hand at this moment in time. Uh, there's not so many because one of the reasons that I wrote the book was because of the fact that particularly on the org design, and because I always say, my role was to design the function of design for the company. And, and on that topic, there's not a lot. Uh, many of the books are very much driven by, uh, uh, you know, how to run brand in a company and then through design. Or uh, it is also very much about uh, creative direction management and what is the role of a creative leader in, in, in all of this. And in my opinion, the creative leader is very much focusing on uh, the quality of the output of the team. But an, uh, an executive design leader, the role that I had as a chief design officer is very much on, on the org design. And, and there are not many books. Uh, there are uh, Echoes, is, for instance, an organization that is pretty active uh, on the design leadership courses. Uh, I'm, I'm working uh, uh, together uh, with them on, on design leadership uh, and design leadership principles. Um, you see that the McKinsey's of this world uh, is, is now uh, McKinsey Design uh, since they have acquired some design companies are doing some more research on the, on, the, on design leadership. So, uh, yeah, if you go out there, the UK Design Council is doing this as well. Other books yes. that I want to mention is maybe, uh, the, I mentioned The Heart of Business from uh, Yuval Juli, which is, I think, very, um, very interesting. Uh, and another book that I mentioned, which is not there yet, but is a book of uh, Don Norman, is uh, he's writing a book at this moment in time about designing a, for a better world. Uh, and this is about uh, how to create meaningful and sustainable and humanity-centered uh, 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 solutions for, for the world, which I'm looking very much uh, uh, forward to and which will be published early 2020, 2023. Yeah, it's wonderful that you know we're starting to see our design elders starting to ask those big picture questions more and more often now, which is great to see. And, and certainly McKinsey embracing design was a significant development. IBM uh, relatively recently embracing design was also a significant well, development. Well, they built it a team of thousands of people, thousands of people. And uh, yeah, there's a few organizations that uh, do remarkable things. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, it, it, it all starts very often uh, by uh, one of the board of directors asking questions about, uh, you know, it, where, where is designing your company and if it is not there, why it is not there. And, you know, and that is how it started for 3M as well. Uh, and, um, and that's how I started the role uh, in, in uh, starting to elevate design uh, for the company as skill. A final question for you. I understand you're a jazz aficionado. Um, yes. How 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 would you uh, equate uh, or would you equate design leadership to jazz in any way? Well, uh, you know, um, there's a few things to learn from jazz. Uh, first of all, I think in uh, in uh, in design, uh, people are overthinking a lot of 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 of, uh, of things in in design. And uh, what I miss with designers is what I call real time creativity. And if you are on stage and you need to improvise in jazz, you need to have real time, uh, real time uh, uh, creativity uh, in order to get in, into your flow. A flow is another important thing. And uh, and I think I encourage all, all of my young designers uh, to uh, to be more focused on on these kind of things because that is an uh, an important thing to be successful as a designer. The other thing is I also refer to this as a uh, to my leadership style. And I remember when I started a job, I was interviewed uh, on the internal uh, broadcast uh, platform uh, by one of the uh, uh, board of directors, uh, uh, of, sorry, one of the directors of the board uh, on, on uh, introducing myself to the company. And, and they asked that question and I said, well, listen, you know, you can play music in two different ways uh, uh, to be uh, 
pretty uh, blood on this. One is you you have a sheet of music and then you play exactly what is on the sheet of music and you um, you give you of course your interpretation but you do it the best you can. The other one is uh, is jazz where you give um, the team uh, <clears throat> the key of the music and the rhythm and then you start to improvise and, and let them sort out and, and let them find the best in themselves. And I said my leadership style is based on jazz. I give them the key of the music. I give them the um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the the rhythm, and uh, and then they need to, do, to run the show. And uh, and I think uh, that was my my introduction to my leadership style, and that is how I like to work together. Yeah, love it. it in, empowerment, right? An important important leadership trend today. Yeah, and also uh, creating an environment where mistakes are allowed. You know, if if you go on stage and you are afraid to make a mistake, you you never get to, to music and to improvisation. So uh, enabling your team that, that mistakes are, are allowed and that they are great learning moments is, is essential for innovation and innovators. Just a reminder to our audience that Max has dropped two links into the chat. One is for a discount on Eric's book, 20% off. And the other is to share your learnings. Just three questions. We really appreciate you filling that out. Uh, Eric, thank you for a really inspiring talk and at the same time practical, which is not an easy balance to achieve. And thanks again to our audience for joining us today. Uh, again, we invite you to share your learnings via the survey and we hope to see you at our remaining sessions this week. Thank you for having me. And uh, you're always welcome to uh, read the book with much more detail on everything I have discussed today. Thank you. <laughs>